Welcome back, students. It's Mrs. Kraft again, and I am here to wrap up our episode. You've done so much work today. Let's take a look at what you've accomplished. We've looked at an essential question. We talked about where do ideas for inventions come from. Then you are able to take your word of the day from Miss K. Invention. We worked with Miss Kathy to sound out that word along with some other words. Remember the word relation. So we talked about that ending, shun. And finally, with Miss K, you worked on the Freyer model. Remember the Freyer model where you wrote that word in the middle and she reminded you before our next section to draw that picture of your invention. So remember to do that. In our next episode, we are going to talk about ways to create a writing journal, which we will continue to use during our classroom time. So please work on that, and we're going to talk about some more inventions the next time Ms. K, Ms. Kathy, and myself are able to see you. So thank you for joining us at this episode of At Home with APS, and we look forward to seeing you the next time as we create those writing journals together and work on some of those writing skills that I know you have in those creative brains of yours. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Webb, and welcome to At Home with APS. Today we've been talking about inventions. So this hour, I'm going to, we're going to look at a specific inventor that you may or may not have heard about. His name is George Ferris. Has anyone ever heard of a Ferris wheel? Have you ever been on a Ferris wheel? Well, right here, we have a Ferris wheel. They can go round and round. And they also go backwards. Sometimes the Ferris wheel seats swing back and forth. Today, I'm going to read a book about Mr. Ferris and his wheel. It was written by Katherine Gibbs Davis and illustrated by Gilbert Ford. The publisher was, is Harcourt, excuse me. The publisher is Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Publishing Company. And so we will begin hearing about Mr. Ferris and his will. It was only 10 months until the next World's Fair, but everyone was still talking about the star attraction of the last World's Fair. At 81 stories, Francis Eiffel Tower was the world's tallest building. Its pointy iron and air tower soared so high that visitors to the top could see all of Paris in one breathtaking sweep. The Eiffel Tower was completed in 1889 and it stood at 960, excuse me, 986 feet, very tall. Now, now it was America's turn to impress the world at the 19, excuse me, the 1893 Chicago's World's Fair. But what could outshine the famous French Tower? And who would build it? A nationwide contest was announced. Now, girls and boys, this was before TV, before the internet, before cell phones. And actually at the World's Fair, the coming up, that's where they invented hamburgers and Cracker Jacks. To make, to an ambitious young civil engineer, this contest was more than a dare. It was a matter of national pride. George Washington Gale Ferris Jr. had already designed some of the country's biggest bridges, tunnels, and roads. He could never allow a French tower to overshadow the America's World's Fair. Why had the United States built the world's first skyscraper? 
George had seen elegant steel frames rise 10 stories high with, it, with his own eyes. Contest drawings poured in from around this country, but most of the plans looked like the Eiffel Tower, only bigger. The fair judges said no to every last one of them. Was this really the best that American engineers could muster? The judges asked. George had an idea, an idea for a structure that would dazzle and more, not just stand like the Eiffel Tower. Back at his drawing board in Pittsburgh, he and his engineering partner, William Grinnell, measured and remeasured. A mistake of even an inch could bring their invention crashing down. So there they are at their drafting table, drawing. It looks like it almost might be, it looks like a circle. Maybe they're starting to draw the Ferris wheel. George arrived in Chicago and made his case to the construction chief of the fair. The chief stared at George's drawings. No one had ever created a fair attraction that huge, that complicated. The chief told George that his structure was so flimsy it would collapse. George had heard enough. He rolled up his drawing papers and said, you are an architect, sir. I am an engineer. George knew something the chief did not. His invention would be delicate looking and strong. It would be both stronger and lighter than the Eiffel Tower because it would be built with an amazing new metal, steel. George was a steel expert and his structure would be made of steel alloy. The judges could not decide. Fall turned to winter as they dilly-dallied. Dilly-dallied means they fooled around. They hadn't made a decision yet. In only four months, the, judge, the fair would open, and it still had no star attraction. What do you think they're going to do? Finally, desperate, they agreed to have George's far-fetched idea give it a try. But they would not give up one penny for the materials to build it. The clock was ticking. George dashed from bank to bank, asking for help. But when he began describing his invention, lenders laughed at him into this, just laughed him into the street. So George used his own savings and convinced a few wealthy investors to join him. Still short of money, he so boldly went ahead and ordered the parts he needed from a dozen different steel mills. Now, have you ever had an idea and people thought, told you, Oh, that's not a good idea. Oh, you could never do that. Well, they told George Ferris the same thing, but he decided to persevere. He persisted and he continued. He did not allow what others say stop him from going forward. In January 1893, George's construction crew began work on the foundation. Shovels broke as the workers tried digging into the frozen ground. It was winter, you know. It was one of the most brutal, brutally cold winters in Chicago's history. Blast! George ordered his crew to dynamite the icy earth. But what they found underneath was scarier still. What do you think they found? Quicksand. The deadly murk could suck a man or a machine under in seconds. The frost at the wheel site was three feet deep. The quicksand was 30 feet in depth and saturated with water. So they had three feet of ice and 20 feet of quicksand. And they kept pumps running all day and night to keep the water and the live steam that they had to use to break the sand and the stone. It was a tough job. George and his brave workers frantically digging, 
Finally, 35 feet down, they hit solid ground. They didn't stop on their dream. They planted two huge towers deep into the depths of the earth and bolted them to the crossbars of steel and poured in cement to hold it all in place. Then carefully, they lowered a 70-ton axle with fittings. The weight of the mogul locomotion train between them. This sturdy structure would hold the gigantic invention steadily even in the strongest Chicago winds. Chicago has extremely strong winds. Has anyone ever heard of the Windy City? Well, that is Chicago. At 45 feet long, the axle, a metal rod, was the longest piece of steel ever forged, which means ever made. And a boy helped hammer it into shape at the Bethlehem Iron Works. People began to come around and look at it. As the time grew shorter, freight trains from all over the country chugged onto the fairgrounds, loaded with more than 100,000 parts. Workers hurried to fit all the pieces together like a giant Lego. Kind of like this Ferris wheel. Looks like it's made out of Lego pieces. Responsible for the wheel's many structural details, Georgia's partner was losing hope. And they had crowds. People came and watched. And you could hit right down on the bottom. It says, one person says, it's undignified. Another says, oh, stand back, dear. It might collapse. A woman says, bet you the wind will blow Ferris's folly into the lake. Nope, I'll fall. It'll fall first. It's going up way too far. They say Ferris Wills has his will in his head. They weren't very kind. Now, Ferris's partner, William Grenot, said, frequently I was discouraged and ready to give up. But through the encouragement of Mr. Ferris, work was always resumed. Have you ever wanted to give up on something you started? Please don't. Keep trying and working at it. This is what Mr. Ferris will, which makes us all able to write a Ferris will. Well, almost all. Ferris wills are not something I like to go in. They're up far, far too high for me. Now, finally, with only two months left, the last section was bolted into place. There stood a perfect, enormous circle, 834 feet in circumference, rising 265 feet above the ground and designed to move in precision with the smallest watch. It looked exactly how George had first imagined it back as a boy on his ranch in Nevada. Now, living near the shore of Nevada's Carson River, George had often watched the water wheel turn around him. Many times he imagined shrinking to the size of one of the toy soldiers and riding up on top of that water wheel. Still, the biggest test was yet to come. The monster wheel had to spin. It just had to. And George's elegant passenger cars still had to be hung. The tireless crew worked day and night to attach them. Each was the size of a living room with enormous picture windows and 40 velvet seats. It sounds very, very, like it was very, very fancy. On June 21st, 1893, the opening day of the World's Fair in Chicago, 2,000 people gathered as flags waved. George took the stage and de dedicated his will to the noble profession of engineering. How many of you out there have ever thought of being an engineer? It's a great profession. Maybe you can develop, maybe not the fair's will, but maybe rides. If you have, have you ever gone to Disneyland or Disney World? Now, they have many rides there that people, engineers, graphic, different designers, they construct. 
Maybe it will be you one day. Then George's wife presented him with a beautiful golden whistle. George and his wife stepped proudly into car number one, followed by their nervous but excited guests. Uniform guards closed and locked the door. Would the will work? What do you think? Let's see. George blew the golden whistle. 2,000 tons of steel began to turn around as the soft clanking of a large chain drove the mighty machine up, up, up. The car quietly floated above the mud, above the noise, and above all the people at the fair. There were two steam engines, one in case one broke, that made the wheel turn. George had hidden them under a wooden platform where the, where the riders boarded. As the car was lifted higher and higher, everyone rose from the velvet seats and crowded to the window. Spread out below them was a dizzying sweep of the fairground, the city of Chicago, and sparkling Lake Michigan, even glimpse of three faraway states. Below, more cars were loaded, and after the people had gone two times around and had 20 glorious airborne minutes in motion, powerful brakes brought the wheel to a whisper soft stop. When the conductor said, all out, everyone begged to go around again and again. The wheel is safe. The news raced through the fairgrounds, through the city of Chicago, and across the country. All summer, visitors from around the world traveled to Chicago's World's Fair. It didn't matter whether one was a senator, a farmer, a boy, or a girl. Everyone wanted to take a spin on the magnificent wheel. Adventurous couples asked to get married on it. One, on hot, steamy days, the wheel was the perfect place to escape up and up, up in the cooling breezes. All you needed was 50 cents. During the 19 weeks the wheel was in, a, in operation, 1.5 million passengers rode it. It revolved more than 10,000 times, withstood gale force winds in that windy city of Chicago, and storms, and did not need one repair. At night, George Ferris's wheel became a magical glowing circle with 3,000 electric light bulbs, another brand new invention. As the queen of the midway made its stately rotation, so did the seasons. Soon a fall chill filled the air. Fair visitors began to thin out. In the late 1800s, homes were still lit with candles and kerosene lamps, not like light bulbs we have today in our homes. The Chicago's World's Fair helped reassure people that electricity was safe. At night, farmers and sailors from as far away as 40 miles could see the wheel's spectacular blaze of lights. On October 26, 1893, just before midnight, the immense twinkling spinning circles slowed to its final stop. The, Chica the Chicago's World's Fair was over. George had called his creation a monster wheel but his investors renamed it after its inventor, the Ferris wheel. And that's what we know today, and that's why today we call it the Ferris wheel. Now, how many of you have ever been on a Ferris wheel? How many of you love Ferris wheels? I'm not one of them, but so many more people than I do. I think they're absolutely beautiful. The Chicago Fair, or the White City, inspired two magical places. The Emerald City in the book, The Wizard of Oz, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, 
by Frank L. Frank Baum in Disneyland. Have you ever been to Disneyland or Disney World? They have Ferris wheels at both places. Now, his father was a construction worker at the fair. He told his son stories about the dreamlike city he helped build. And young Walt, that's Walt Disney, grew up to build famous amusement park that stays open year round. And that would be Disneyland. Visitors returned to their home to tell the story of the world's greatest ride and long before copies of the Ferris wheel began popping up around the world. In 1894, the next Ferris wheel appeared in California on a cliff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, lit up at night. It was the first landmark seen by ships on their way home. Today, Ferris wheels are the most familiar and beloved carnival ride at state fairs and amusement parks. A ride on, on one still feels like flying to the moon, and oh, the view is beautiful on Ferris wheels. I hope you enjoyed this book, Ferris and His Will. Thank you so much for joining us at this episode of At Home with APS. Thank you, Dr. Webb, for that incredible story about the Ferris wheel. I grew up about three hours from Chicago, so I was there all the time, but I've never ridden a Ferris wheel in Chicago. So I'm going to put that on my bucket list. Right now, I want to talk to you about writing. Writing is such an incredibly creative thing that we can all do, and we can do while you're sitting at home. And so we want to guide you through that process. And to get you started, I wanted to give you some ideas for creating a journal to keep your writing. So let's talk about some ways to do that. If you have a composition book at home, that's perfect. You can use that to write in, and that's all done for you. If you have a spiral notebook, the one with the, the metal on the edges, you could also use that, and that would be just perfect also. But if you don't have that at home, here are some ways for you to create a journal to use for your writing. The first one is pretty simple. If you have a binder, it could be any color, you can put paper inside and that becomes a writing journal. However, even simpler, if you do not have that, you might have lined paper at home, just like you had at school when you would get some from your teacher. If you have that at home, you can take the lined paper, like I did, and I found some construction paper. So construction paper can come in a very big sheet, and if you have that at home, great. You can just fold that in half, put your paper inside, and then attach it. However, I did not have a large sheet. I only had two small ones. You can see they are different colors. So what I did is grab two colors that I liked. I didn't have the same color, so it, that's fine. I put my, my paper inside, and then I punched holes. And then I went to my wrapping paper area and found some ribbon to tie. So that's one idea. And then you can go ahead and decorate it. You can draw on it. Maybe your favorite activity. Uh, maybe you could create uh, a pens and papers on the front so that we know it's your writing journal. What I'd like you to do is make sure you also put your name on it so that everyone knows that it belongs to you. So if you don't have any of those materials at home, here's another idea. I found some cardboard. So cardboard, you could find it perhaps outside, maybe have a grown-up help you locate some. You could also use a cereal box, right? You've got a front and a back. A grown-up could help you cut that out, and then you could create your cover. I created a cover, and then I found some pictures to glue on the front. So I found pictures of 
tacos, because I love tacos. They're not just for Tuesdays, right? I love to be outside, so I found a picture of somebody going on a kayak. I also love to eat healthy fruits and vegetables, so I found some oranges. And I like to exercise, so I glued a picture of that. So if you use some cardboard and you think, oh, it's just brown, you could draw a picture with your crayons or markers, or you could find pictures to glue on the front. I'm not the best artist, so I went ahead and did that, and now I have my journal. So if you have paper at home, I know some of you might have the lined paper that you often used at school. If you don't have that, you may have copy paper that's just plain, and that's fine too. So whatever you have, create your journal, and during our next sessions, we will use these journals to talk about our inventions. So Ms. Webb wrote you a book about the Ferris wheel, right? That was an incredible invention. In our last episode, we looked at different inventions that were created made from cheese. And we're going to continue on our episodes talking about inventions because we, we have our question, right? Our essential question is thinking about ideas and how we can transfer those ideas into actual creations. So thank you, boys and girls. Miss Jacobson is now going to come up and talk to you. about the Ferris wheel and some other really incredible inventions that she's going to show you examples of and then hopefully spur your creative juices. Hi everybody, it's Miss Jacobson again for our last 30 minutes of our first day of filming here at home with APS. And I hope you enjoyed the book, uh, Mr. Ferris and His Wheel. I found this at a bookstore here in Albuquerque and bought it because I absolutely love Ferris wheels. Um, I've been on several of them around the country and even some overseas when I've traveled. And I've never been on a huge, huge one, but I have been on the replacement Ferris wheel that is now in Chicago. And that particular Ferris wheel is one of the oldest Ferris wheels in America. Not the oldest, but one of the oldest. It celebrated its 106th birthday, I believe, this last year. And it's an awful lot of fun. It's at Navy Pier in Chicago. And I have family that lives there. So when um, we go, oftentimes we will go and, uh, and visit that Ferris wheel. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about inventions. and the engineering and the science that goes along with building these kinds of things. An inventor, as we heard earlier today, is a person who is trying to make something that's never been made before. And while sometimes those inventors are scientists and sometimes they are mathematicians or architects, sometimes they are mechanical engineers and they are trained so that they can figure out how metal fits together, how much weight it can hold, um, maybe how heavy a wooden structure is going to be, um, what kind of temperature melts certain materials. So they have to know a lot of math, and they have to know a lot of science, and they have to learn how things work. Now, in Mr. Ferris and his wheel, they were talking about this type of Ferris wheel, the model that I have here. This is made out of Connex blocks. And I made this, somebody, a friend gave me this kit for this Ferris wheel because I saw one at a school that I visited when I was first starting to get my degree to be a principal. And I was a principal at Tierra Antigua Elementary. So hi Tierra Antigua Firebirds if you're out there watching today. So the Ferris wheels that I've been familiar with, they have these spokes kind of like a bicycle wheel would have. Um, and they help keep the outer frame of the Ferris wheel steady. And they are a certain length to support the outside of the Ferris wheel. And then they also have to support these little cars that people would sit in. Now, if you've been to the New Mexico State Fair here in Albuquerque, 
or any state fair around the United States, you're going to see this type of Ferris wheel a lot of the time, where the, the little cars are in the open air. When the Ferris wheel turns around, you, they, they kind of swing down a little bit. You feel the, the wind blowing in your hair. Um, sometimes they go a little fast. Sometimes they go forward. Sometimes they go backward, just like Dr. Webb had said when she was reading the book. But now there are new engineering designs where Ferris wheels do not have center spokes. All of the outside is connected by wire. And the cars, instead of being these little, look, they look like park benches, they are actual rooms with glass surrounding the outside, kind of like a capsule, like a space capsule almost. And some of them even fit as many as 28 people inside. You don't sit down, you can walk around, and you can see the whole city where that Ferris wheel has been built. There are several cities in the world that have those. Now, I was pulling up some information um, on my computer about Ferris wheels, and it turns out that the biggest one in the world was completed in 2014. Any ideas where it might be? What do you think? And some of you may have been here. It's actually in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's called the High Roller, and it is 550 feet in height. Now, Mr. Ferris's wheel, when he first built the original Ferris wheel in 1893, his Ferris wheel was 264 feet in height. So almost half of the size now of the world's largest Ferris wheel. I think that's incredible. So if we were to imagine that this is the high roller in Las Vegas, Mr. Ferris's wheel would only come up to about right here. So imagine that you know, in terms of how high that large Ferris wheel is. Now, the largest Ferris wheel that I've ever been on is called the London Eye. And it's in London, England. And it's 443 feet high. And it also has the cars where you go, can go and sit inside and walk around. And about 15 people can go inside one of those cars. And you get to see the whole city when you're up there. And it's fun to see it at night. And I like being on regular carnival Ferris wheels at night, too, because I like the way the city looks with the twinkling lights and how a carnival or a fair looks after the lights come on. So I think that that's a lot of fun. But there's lots of movies. Ferris wheels are movie stars. There's lots and lots of movies that feature Ferris wheels and other carnival rides. And like Dr. Webb said, who knows what the next one's going to be? It might be you. So... I want you to kind of think a little bit about how Ferris wheels have changed over the last 120 years. And I also want you to consider how some other things have changed, other inventions that we use today that were around 100 years ago. They were around when Mr. Ferris was designing and engineering the Ferris wheel, but also uh, may have been used in other ways. One of the things that I want you to consider is back around 1860 or so, that was 100 years before I was born, when kids came to school, they didn't necessarily have any, they did not have any kind of computer or device like an iPad or a laptop or an iPhone. But when they practiced their lessons, they, may not ha they did not have uh, spiral notebooks and those kinds of things. They might have had some paper, but paper was expensive. And so rather than practice on paper, they would save the paper for a final product, a final essay or a final project that they were working on and use it for that purpose. But they would use a slate, like a little chalkboard, a little blackboard to um, write their math lessons or their spelling words on. A little bit later on, in around 1920, people started using things like this spelling tablet. This is called a Franklin spelling tab tablet. It's actually um, got a date on it here of 1888. But my uncle, 
when he was in school in the late 20s, 1920s, he used these. And they would buy these as part of their school supplies. And this is what they'd practice their spelling words or take their spelling test on. So it changed from within just about 50 years from going from a slate to going to some sort of a notebook. And I know that a lot of you have experienced online lessons and ebooks and other kinds of things. Well, back in the day, this one, this is called a fourth grade electric eclectic reader. And this one was written in 1898. And this one's pretty beat up. I bought this at a, at a junk store. But if you can look a little bit, it doesn't quite look like what a fourth grade reader might look like right now. Ours have a lot bigger print, a lot bigger type. But um, this, these were the stories of history and science and poetry and other kinds of literature that teachers would teach a student back in 1893. Now, brand new, that book might look like this. Now, this is a first grade book. This is the same type of book. It's just a reproduction. This is not old. So this is only about two or three years old. But inside their textbook, it would have alphabets and pictures and words that they wanted to practice and learn. And this is called a McGuffey's Eclectic Primer. And a primer was for the kids that are now like in kinder and first grade. So they, are, they would use a book like this to learn how to read and also to learn how to write. Now today, a lot of you are using computers or laptops that are in your computer lab at your school. You may have them at home. You also may have access to an iPad. Well, before we could write our essays and our stories and things um, on an iPad or on, even on a, on a laptop or on a desktop computer, you might find something that looked like this. Any idea what this might be? You may have seen one before. It's actually called a typewriter. And this one is by a company called Royal. And this one belonged to my grandfather. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this, this piece here back and forth so you can hear what it does. When you, when you would um, get to the end of a line as you were pressing out the alphabet letters to spell the words, and it, those, these little hammers would come up. Let me see if I can get one to come up and stay up so you can see it. It would come up and strike the paper, and there's a blue ribbon that has ink on it here, and it would leave the impression of the letter on the paper. And as you would move to a different line, you had to actually force it with your hand to go to the next line, and you could do that. When you got to the end of a line, if you were typing away, and maybe you were click clacking along, and I'm just going to let it go here, you'd make this sound. Whoop. Do you hear the bell? It sounds like a little, like a counter bell ringing. And that's how you knew to turn the wheel one more space and then go back to the beginning and type your next line. Now, I love my laptop and I use it a lot. And it weighs about maybe a pound and a half. This typewriter is made out of cast iron and it weighs about 55 pounds. So to move it is really a chore. So once you got it in your office or in your classroom, it stayed where it belonged. And, but secretaries and people who typed a lot of words, a lot of books, letters, other documents, they would have something like this. Now, typewriters changed over time, but now we have these electronic versions that have the keyboard on it. But the keyboard, the letters on the keyboard are in the same order that they are on this typewriter. So that, over 100 years, has not changed. So that's one of the reasons why we have the letters in the order that we have them here. Because when people learned how to type, they learned them in a certain position on the keyboard, this kind of keyboard. And when computers came around, they just continued that same practice. So if you're wondering why they're not just A, B, C, D, E, F, G, E, that's why. 
so another thing that you may have, another invention, I shouldn't say thing, another invention that you may have some experience with are cameras. Now, today, I've been snapping a lot of pictures using my iPhone. We've been recording here since about 8.30 this morning with all the teachers that did the KNME broadcast uh, for you today. And I've been taking some photographs for my scrapbook and to share with my other colleagues at APS. So this has come in really handy. But before I had an iPhone that had a camera on it, I actually had a digital camera, I've got it upside down even, that looked a little bit like this. Some were a little bigger. Um, some had lenses that actually extended and popped out. But I could, it worked basically the same way as this. It had a card reader or a SIM card in it. And I would take the pictures that I wanted, but then I'd pop the card out, and I'd go take it to a photo developer, and they'd print up my pictures for me. And that still can happen. You can still do that by plugging in your iPhone at a photo developer. But before that, we had cameras that this one actually stays in the case. This is a 35 millimeter camera. The 35 millimeter has to do, I believe, with the size of this lens. And you would have to put a vinyl film inside, kind of like a strip of vinyl that would roll up on a roll, and you would put that in here, and it had little sections, and as you took pictures, it would imprint the photograph on those little sections of the vinyl, and then you would very carefully, when it, the vinyl was all filled up with photographs, you would take that vinyl out, and you'd send it to a developer, and then they would print your pictures on paper for you. This is a really neat camera. It's, again, it's very heavy. Um, it's probably made out of steel and iron, but it does have some plastic on it. This camera belonged to my dad, and it is probably about 50 years old. So cameras have changed even over the years. And there are older cameras that look like this. The first real pictures that anybody ever took were during the American Civil War, during battles. And there were some people, um, men, Mr. Kodak and Mr. Eastman, who developed um, how to take photographs and how to put them on film and print pictures. And um, their cameras were probably bigger than this Ferris wheel. And they stood on large stands. So this one was considered back in 1950, when my dad probably got it, this camera was considered very modern. There's lots and lots of other things that we can show you. This is my favorite, though, and I have to tell you that I, I, when I first saw this, I had no idea what this was. This belonged to my grandmother. Can you, maybe you've seen something like this? Do you have any idea what it might be? Well, I'm going to give you a hint. You would put bread in here. Does that answer any questions for you? Yeah, it's a toaster. This toaster is 1922 toaster, and it toasts two pieces of bread. You put the bread in here, you flip it closed, and it would have had an electric cord that you plugged in, and it toasted one side of the bread, and then you would have to turn it around to toast the other side of the bread. And there's another cage on the other side just like it. So you would toast one side of the bread, and then you would toast another. And now we have the pop-up toasters um, that you use probably a lot for breakfast and other times of the day when you're eating. So things that people have made like this have been designed by engineers and are used for lots and lots of different purposes. I've been collecting old things like this for many years. And we talked this morning about collections with the younger students. And we talked about starting a rock collection or a shell collection or a button collection or when you go out on your walks when you're trying to get some air and exercise during the school closures that you could collect leaves or seed pods or any number of things. Some people collect comic books or they collect cartoons um, or they collect Star Wars memorabilia. All kinds of things that would make great collections. My collections are old things. Things like this wooden box. This is what cheese used to come in. 
Now, when you buy cheese at the grocery store, you buy it in a bag or in a plastic container. And in the old days, it came in foil inside a wooden box like this. So over the years, they've learned how to do new things, how to take care of different kinds of, of products, make them last longer, make them more affordable, make them more usable for people. And some of these items that we see here today have made that happen. So while we are in this closure time, I really hope that you will think a little bit about, number one, if you could invent something, what would it be? If you could solve any problem in the world or create some sort of wonderful machine or device that did amazing things, what would it be? And that journal that you made with Mrs. Kraft a few minutes ago could be the first place that you start to write that story. I have a journal that I'm going to write my story in, and in a few weeks when we are filming some more, I'm going to share that story with you. I hope you've had a really great day, but I also hope that you've learned something today. This morning, we worked on making puppets with kids. We helped them to practice their alphabet letters. So if you have a younger brother or a younger sister, then um, this might be a really good time for you to help them to make sure that when they come back to school, they know all of their alphabet letters and all of their um, sounds and maybe even some words that you can practice with them. We've talked about looking at pictures and trying to figure out what's happening in a photograph. For students that are learning how to read or write, that's a really important strategy to use. And you, as a fourth grader or fifth grader, um, are getting really good at that at this point in your life. And so being able to write in a journal and to start some creative stories, that's a good way for this to happen. And you can write it down, you can type it, you can put it on an iPad or an iPhone, and then you can share it with us. So I hope you've had a really good time. We have one more activity today before we say goodbye. And um, we're going to ask Mrs. K to come up. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to be mindful and how to calm yourself down when you need to, especially when you're hearing things on the news that might be a little hard to understand. So we will see you tomorrow. And I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. K now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Hello everyone, I'm Mrs. K. Um, you might recognize me because maybe I've been out to your school before, or perhaps you watched the lesson I did earlier with our vocabulary words. Or maybe, if you're a little bit older, you were even one of my students a long time ago. Before we sign off for the day, I want to just talk to you a little bit about how we might be feeling right now. Things right now are kind of weird. They're different. We're not going to school like we normally did. We're probably not doing some of the activities that we typically do. Um, and that can make us feel a lot of really, oh, sorry, a lot of really strong emotions. I know for me, um, this time when my life isn't like it normally is, it makes me feel anxious. Anxious is sort of a different word for being nervous or worried. Maybe you might be feeling anxious or maybe frustrated or sad or angry or maybe excited. Maybe a lot of good things are happening for you right now. These emotions are totally natural. We're humans and part of being a human being is having feelings and emotions, and that's okay. But sometimes those feelings can feel too big. They can prevent us from focusing at school, or they can make it hard to do some of the things we enjoy. Sometimes those really big emotions are uncomfortable. So, also as humans, we need to think about ways that we can develop some tools to help us cope with those emotions. That's a big word, cope. Um, when I'm thinking of coping strategies, I'm thinking of ways that I can help myself calm down so that I can focus and learn and feel okay. 
So today we talked about a lot of inventors and how they made tools to help them solve a problem. Let's talk about some tools you can use to help you solve some of the problems maybe you're feeling with your emotions right now. I know that when I get really frustrated or really anxious, I have a hard time breathing. I start breathing fast, my heart rate gets faster, and it's hard for me to focus. So let me show you something that you can do at home um, if you're feeling a really intense or a big emotion. It's called five finger breathing. All you need for this are your lungs and your hands. I think you've got all those things. We're ready to go. What I want you to do is hold up one hand and then use your pointer finger from another hand or the other hand. And you're going to use this finger to trace your hand like this. The key is we want to go super slow. Now while we're tracing our finger, we're focusing on our breathing. So when I'm going up one finger, I'm breathing in. I'm inhaling. And when I go down, I'm exhaling. I'm breathing out. Inhale, breathe in. Exhale, breathe out. Can you do the last three fingers with me? That was great. That was a lot of good breathing. That does a couple different things for us. It slows down our heart rate. It makes the blood travel um, at a more even rate throughout our system, which makes us calmer. Um, it also can help us to focus on something else. So we're not thinking about, we're worried about what's going to happen tomorrow, or we're thinking about something that happened in the past. If we can focus on just our breathing, that can help us calm down. We're going to do it one more time together. Remember, you just need your fingers and your lungs. This time, I went a little too fast last time, I think, because I was nervous. So I'm going to slow down. I want you to slow down with me. And while you're doing this, I want you to only think about breathing in and breathing out. It's hard, but we can do it. You ready? Here we go. Good job. I really like using this when I'm at school because I can just put my hands under my desk and do five finger breathing and nobody even knows I'm doing it. This is something you can use at home. When we go back to school, this is something you can use at school. But what I would like to challenge you to do is to teach this skill to someone else. Somebody else might need to practice mindfulness and to practice calming down their breathing, and their thoughts. I encourage you to teach this skill to a grown-up in your home, or maybe a brother or sister. Or maybe you can call a friend on the phone, and you can tell them how to do this over the phone. Before we go, let's talk about a few other things that you can do if those big emotions are feeling too intense for you. One thing that we can do to make our lives at home a little bit more like school is making a schedule. Do you remember at school, your teacher often had a schedule that had all the things you were doing during the day? You can make one of those at home. Sometimes if we have a schedule and we know exactly what's coming, it can help us feel more secure. So some things you might put on your schedule, mm, what do you do first? Well, wake up, probably. Now, if I was doing this at home, I would probably do it with a younger sibling 
and maybe I could write the words and they'd draw the pictures. So maybe maybe you could work on this together as a family. I want you to think about some other things that you could add to your list. What would you do after you wake up, maybe? Maybe eat breakfast? I bet you can come up with a whole list of things that you can do, a schedule that you can make, so that you and your brothers and sisters can feel like you have some of that security that you have at school. One thing that I hope you put on your schedule is watching us every day. We're going to be here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday with new teachers and new lessons and lots of fun things that we're going to do with you while you're at home. One last thing that you might think about doing is thinking about how you can help someone else. Sometimes when we take time to do something nice for somebody else, it can make those big, heavy emotions feel less big and less heavy. Maybe you could help a parent um, cook dinner. Maybe you could write a card to another family member and send it to them in the mail. I'm excited to hear about all of the kind things that you guys do for one another during this time. And I'm so thankful that you spent your day with us today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thanks for joining us for this episode of At Home with APS.